So the first thing I want to emphasize in this talk is that there's nothing wrong with creation. You couldn't have life without death. You couldn't have positive emotions without negative ones. You can't have evolution without mutation and without cancer. The lion, in other words, will never ever lie down with the lamb and nor should it. For the billions of years that life existed on this earth before human beings came along and the hundreds of millions of years that life will continue after we disappear, the very nature of life, the fabric of the way life reproduces itself and continues on has been just fine. It's been good. This is the new creation story with which we have to come when we understand Jesus. As Vicky Balabansky said earlier today, the early Christians tried to understand and communicate Jesus in the thought forms of the Greeks, relying on concepts like Logos, and also there are Hebrew roots relying on concepts like the wisdom and trying to bring them together. We now have a new creation story to understand Jesus. It's steeped in evolution and it begins with death and pain and suffering being in the world long before human beings appeared. So whatever Jesus is, he isn't the second Adam who's come to save us and the rest of creation from the sin of the first Adam. There was no one man through whom death entered the world. Also, whatever Jesus is, he isn't the vehicle through which God experiences and comes in solidarity with flesh. It's quite common in eco-theology to stress the fact that Jesus wasn't just a man, that he was flesh. That when God became incarnate, God didn't just become a man or even a human being, but became flesh and therefore knows what it's like to be a creature and express solidarity with creatureliness. But to me, that's still anthropocentrism at its most extreme. I'm persuaded by the number of feminists who say that uh, God couldn't experience what it was like to be a woman by becoming incarnate as a man. Jesus had no idea of what it was like to be a woman, and so therefore neither does God if God's experience of womanhood relies on the incarnation in Jesus. In the same way, a Jewish man living 2,000 years ago, particularly Jesus, has no idea what it's like to be a 21st century white Australian with two kids and a mother dying of cancer in hospital. It can't be limited to God's enfleshment in Jesus that gives God an experience of life. God knows what it's like to be a bat, to see the world through sonar, because God is in the bat. The way in which God encounters and experiences life is being present in all creatures through the Spirit. All creatures live and move and have their being in God, and God is present in all of them. To limit, as I said, God's experience of life and uh, to say that it's sufficient for God's experience of life to be limited to human beings and to a man in particular is just not tenable. Whoever Jesus is and whatever he's about, he's about the connection between God and human beings. If you believe in the incarnation that God became flesh in Jesus, then it's something to do specifically with the story of human beings and God. Jesus' offer of salvation, his call to repentance, is directed at human beings and in fact not even all human beings. We have Jesus' parable of the one sheep who is lost and the 99 sheep who stay with the shepherd. Jesus talks about the celebration over the one who is saved being greater than the celebration over the 99 who need no salvation. But that does kind of indicate that most people don't need it. So Jesus' offer of salvation is directed primarily to that one sheep, to the 1%. We might draw parallels in our day in this post-Wall Street world with the 1% of the super rich among us, those to whom Jesus' warnings against wealth might well be directed. Could be the 1% of our human existence since the beginning of agriculture. Of course, for most of our life, we lived as nomadic hunter-gatherers. Maybe in this moment in our history, God and humanity need to interact in a new way and Jesus brings a warning to the 1% of us who have lost connection with life. As I said, there's also the story of the prodigal son. There's the story of the prodigal brother, the prodigal son, the one who goes off and wastes the family's resources, while the older brother wisely stays behind with the family. He doesn't need salvation because he's remained where he's ought to be. 
Jesus directs a warning to the prodigal who's taken the family's resources and gone off and ended up in the pig pen. In our day, maybe the climate change pig pen. Who is the prodigal brother in our world and who is the wise older brother who remained in the family and lived within its resources? So salvation happens in different stages and it's directed at different people. It's also worth mentioning the parable of the sheep and the goats, which in Matthew's Gospel is about all the nations, in other words, those who aren't Christians. But it's clear in that parable as well, as it is uh, in the parable of the prodigal son, that salvation doesn't depend on confession of a certain uh, set of beliefs, for example, the Trinity, or what we might believe about Jesus' pre-existent nature. It depends on action. It's through the action of the prodigal son and through the action of the sheep, as opposed to the goats, that people are saved. So, Jesus' salvation happens in different ways to different people. There's the one percent, the one sheep, the rich, that are called to repent, that hear the words, woe to you who are rich, that are warned that they need to give up their riches, that separate them from God and also from other people. They are the ones that Jesus came to save. Secondarily, or that God attempted to save through Jesus. Secondarily, there's the older brother and the 99 sheep. The salvation they need is about liberation, being set free from bearing the consequences of the wasteful lifestyle of the prodigal son, so that they too can have enough resources to live. There's the rest of creation that sits there probably with the older brother. Those who suffer in factory farms, those who are penned in sow stalls for the sake of the convenience of the one who is lost. There's nothing in their nature that needs to be changed or redeemed. Predators don't need to turn into vegetarians, but they need to be set free from bondage so that they can live the kind of life which God desires for them and so that God is free to then experience the richness and abundance of life through them. They are our neighbours because they are affected by everything that we do. So for the rest of creation, we're not looking for an end of death. And in fact, for the poor humans among us as well, we're not looking for an end of death, an end of pain. We're not looking for a complete absence of suffering or the removal of cancer. But instead, liberation so that every creature on this earth, human and other creature, has the opportunity to live a rich and abundant life for as long as that life lasts them. So really, it doesn't matter. A lot of things don't matter about what we believe about Jesus. It doesn't really matter if Jesus is the pre-existent Christ in whom all things came together and for whom all things exist. If believing that makes you live better with the rest of creation, then that's great. But really that belief only matters to the extent that it makes you listen to Jesus' teachings and act on them as you emulate his lifestyle in the 21st century. That's what matters to the rest of creation. It doesn't matter if Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And of course, that wasn't finally formalized until the 4th century, so it can't matter too much. What matters is if believing that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity makes you take his teaching seriously and emulate his lifestyle here in the 21st century. What matters, what brings hope to creation and the rest of the poor among us is whether we listen to Jesus' teachings, observe his lifestyle and put that into practice as disciples here in the 21st century. We just need to work out whether we're that one sheep or the 99, whether we're the prodigal brother or the wise brother who remained with the family in relationship, or whether we may be a bit of both. Once we've worked out who we are, we need to look to Jesus' teaching and the way he lived his life to work out what to do about it, as we walk the way of Christ together in creation and indeed as creation.